Welcome back to the second part of our intelligence experience this morning. General Gibson introduces well to many of the main themes that we'll be talking about in the next panel. Briefly, uh, just as a brief overview of strategic intelligence, strategic intelligence contributes to policy formulation and military planning at the national and international levels. It provides decision makers with interpretation of events that provide context intended to provide decision advantage over the adversary. Key to understanding intelligence at this level we're, um, is understanding how to be a good consumer of intelligence, as General Gibson mentioned. It's knowing how to write, answer the, ask the right questions and receive that information and integrate it. Our next two scholars are going to show you how that's done. They both from, come from academia and have worked in this community, with this community, and in this space for decades. I am thrilled to, to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor Robert Jervis is the Adlai Stevenson Professor of International Affairs at Columbia University. He specializes in international politics in general and security policy, decision making, and theories of conflict and cooperation. He serves on the board of nine scholarly journals and has authored over 100 publications. Among his several books are Why Intelligence Fails, Lessons from the Iranian Revolution in the Iraq War, American Foreign Policy in a New Era, System Effects, Complexity in Political and Social Life, the Meaning of the Nuclear Revolution, and the Logic of Images in International Relations. Uh, Jervis is, Professor Jervis is also co-editor of the Security Studies series published by Cornell University Press and author of, one of the, a, a book that many of you are probably very familiar with, Perception and Misperception in International Politics. Importantly, he received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, um, where I went. Um, I just want to make a, a, pers a make personal statement about Professor Jervis and his role in international in intelligence studies. Many of us who study this got our start thinking about his work and thinking about the themes and questions he brought up. And I think Rose can also attest to this, that without him, we really wouldn't have the foundation to do this work. So I'm honored to, to, to have him here with us today. I think we all are. Um, our second speaker is Professor Rose McDermott. She is the David and Mariana Fisher University Professor of International Relations at Brown University and a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She works in the area of political psychology, American foreign and defense policy, and gender. She received her PhD and MA from Stanford University and has taught at Cornell and University of California, Santa Barbara. She has held fellowships at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Olin Institute for Strategic Studies, and the Women in Public Policy Program, all at Harvard University. She has been a fellow at the Stanford Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences twice. She is the author of five books, a co-editor of two additional volumes, and author of over 200 academic articles across a wide variety of disciplines encompassing topics such as gender, experimentation, intelligence, cybersecurity, emotion, and decision making, and the biological and genetic bases of political behavior. Uh, we will have both speakers back to back. So Professor Jervis, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, and I'm uh, glad to be here. It's a special pleasure to be a group where things actually start on time and in which no one is uh, doing email or shopping during my lecture. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is unusual. Uh, um, that uh, my, one of my so hobbies is doing intelligence post-mortems, as I tell my friends in the government, that you really don't want to see me coming through your door. It means you've screwed up bad, bigly. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, some problem with that, because if you study mostly failures, you may get a skewed view of the way intelligence works. And I'm happy to say that Rose's project looks at successes as well as failures, and she'll bring out some of them those contrasts. Um, General Gibson said a good deal of what I want to say and said it better than I will say it, so I want to improvise and also uh, uh, but take off from some of the things that she said. And I want to start with one that's particularly important, which is the importance and difficulty of trust between intelligence consumers and producers. Uh, and this is not limited to the military sphere. It holds as well for the 
civilians. And the trust is both essential but difficult because there is inevitably several tensions, and some that, that General Gibson alluded to, between the consumers and the producers. And the key, if one can do it, is managing those tensions in a productive rather than an unproductive way. And I think you'll see what I mean as I go along. Let me start with what I often do for those, and those of you who've read anything of mine know, which is uh, uh, use examples. I believe the plural of anecdote is data, and that we learn a lot from specific historical cases. And the one I want to start with is the Battle of Jutland in World War I, which some, I hope m many of you, even those not in the Navy, you know, know the importance of Jutland, the only really major uh, naval battle in World War I that ended in, uh, with tactically indecisive, or if anything, a defeat for Great Britain, but strategically a victory for Britain uh, because it was able to continue the command of the seas. The role of intelligence in both a narrower and a broader sense are really crucial in the battle and give some lessons that we all were thinking about. Some particular to problems of military organization, some more general. And it starts with the problem of trust. The essential problem for the British Navy was in a sense, it, it was stationed very, had to be stationed quite far north, far from where a battle might occur. So intelligence as to the German uh, fleet led by Admiral Scheer was absolutely crucial because if the German fleet got out and the British fleet didn't know it, the German fleet could do grave damage. And at one point, the... Uh, the operational leaders of the British Navy had some reason to be concerned. And there was a special intelligence unit known as Room 40. And so the, uh, in fact, the head of operations went down to Room 40, but he didn't trust the intelligence people. He hadn't worked with them. He didn't think they were terribly good, and he didn't think they could keep secrets. What he wanted to know was where, you know, where do you think Admiral Scheer's fleet is? How prepared? Is it leaving port preparing? What all that? But he didn't ask them that because that would give away too much of what the British, his own people, were thinking. Instead, he asked a very narrow, specific question. He said, where is Admiral Scheer's call sign? Those of you not in the Navy know this is you know, his you know, Morse signature. Uh, where can you geolocate it? The intelligence person was asked a very specific question. So he answered it. And he said, it's in Kiel, which is the port where the German fleet was when it was not sallying out. So he goes, the uh, admiral says, thank you, leaves, goes out, and telegraphs uh, Lord uh, or, Admiral Jellicoe is the leader of the British fleet and says that Shear's fleet is in port. That's not right. Shear's fleet has left. What the intelligence person knows is that whenever the fleet goes out, in order to deceive the British, they keep the call sign in Kiel. He knows that very well. He wasn't asked, where is the fleet? He gives a correct answer. So the British at a certain point then go out and in effect get ambushed because he didn't ask the right question because he did not trust his intelligence people. Also, you can fault perhaps you know, the intelligence person for not saying, why do you ask? Because it's always in Kiel. When the fleet's in Kiel, they keep the call sign. When they go out, they keep it there to fool us. So maybe the intelligence person should have asked, but this is a military organization. You people uh, uh, know better than I how those organizations operate. Um, maybe he didn't trust the, uh, the more operational people and didn't want to tell him that we, that British intelligence knew that the Germans were trying to deceive the British. That nearly, you know, 
only a slight exaggeration to say that could have cost Britain World War I. Because if the British fleet had been defeated, Britain could have been blockaded, game over. Um, so there's more to the story uh, than this. The first encounter was between the battle cruisers um, of the two navies. They were the vanguard. They, they were like battleships, only more lightly armored and faster. <clears throat> the British side led by uh, uh, Beatty. It was very good, but rather impetuous. In the first uh, I, half hour or so, three British battle cruisers were destroyed. I mean, this is a complete disaster. Beatty, being British and rather cool, turns to his executive officer after the third one and says, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. Well, what was wrong was an intelligence failure of a different type, but not, not strategic intelligence, but not irrelevant. The Germans had examined the technical aspects carefully and integrated with the operations. And after one unpleasant experience, they learned that you needed to install flash suppressors. These are uh, things that mean that if the turret of the ship is hit, you don't get fire extending down to where the ammunition is stored. Because without that, a hit on the turret, which is unfortunate but not in any way disastrous, can lead to all the ammunition stored below the turret exploding, destroying, disabling if not destroying the ship. Germans realized that through experience. The British uh, had great confidence in their ships and didn't examine this. So they lost three ships that they should not have lost uh, through a failure to understand how their systems were working. They also failed, well, this is more debatable. If any of you were naval history buffs, you may know the debate about this, but the standard story, at least told by the civilians, is that another reason the, German, the British fleet failed was that their gun laying was inadequate. The gunners were quite skilled, but maneuvering, uh, firing between two ships when they're both maneuvering takes, in effect, a computer. And the first computer was not developed into, by the code breaking in World War II, but was developed by the British to solve the gun laying problem. The problem was there were competition here, and there was an outside inventor who came up with something that worked extremely well. The Royal Navy was not happy with outside inventors, and they went with an inside system that did not work very well. So the British firing at Jutland was quite inaccurate when they had the better system and one in which many scholars argue and that this is room for debate, uh, they could have had one that had worked. Uh, finally, they nearly uh, failed well, not fine, but true, because there was no communica inadequate communication both among the ships in each part of the British fleet and between the fleets that the British Admiral Beatty, who was leading the vanguard of the battle cruisers, uh, when he realized he was in trouble and had to turn around and go back and join the main fleet, failed to adequately communicate that to Jellicoe, who was the commander of the entire fleet, and the main battleships that would then fight the next engagement. They didn't give where they were doing, what they were doing, and why. Then finally, after the main engagement, uh, the British do relatively better, the Germans break it off, and the British, uh, the German uh, fleet has to go back to its base. So there, and there are essentially two routes it can take given the minefields and the shoals in this area. The British intelligence, room 40, knows the route they're taking because they are uh, reading the German traffic and they can, they're 
breaking the codes. This time, the person in the Admiralty goes down and asks the right question, and he gets the right answer. And he tells them which route he's taking, and that's cabled, uh, you know, telegraphed to Jellico. Jellico gets it. And he says, "Why should I believe this? The last report from intelligence told me that Admiral Shear was in Kiel, and two hours later he ambushes my fleet." So intelligence is no good. I'm not going to believe this. He was not told that the reason the admiralty had misinformed him was not the intelligence was wrong, but they and the admiralty had misinterpreted it. So he does not know where the fleet is. Finally, the uh, Two fleets actually meet almost by accident. It's at night, and remember, night, we're, you know, no radar. And, uh, and the German fleet crosses, in a sense, right in back of the British fleet. Um, and one of the uh, captains are in the British fleet literally sees this. And you, this is the perfect opportunity. The, the British fleet is much larger. It is, with all the problems, more capable. It could destroy the German Navy and not end the war, but make a significant difference. But under Admiralty existing rules, a lower-ranked officer is not allowed to tell a superior something the superior could know on his own. So in fact, the XO can't say, Captain. Look back there. There's where the German fleet is. He can't tell him. He doesn't tell him. Sheer escapes. The battle is, ends. Well, OK, there are several things here. But the first one is the one that, that uh, General Gibson stressed so much, the importance of trust between the intelligence people and the operators. And that's very difficult to build. I mean, we can make various cultural jokes about the British and you know, why the admirals especially weren't going to listen to the intel people, but it's much broader than that. There first is tension between uh, people whose jobs are operational. And I don't have to stress this to you because most of you are in that thing. You have to make important life and death decisions and you have to convey confidence to your the people you're working with and your subordinates who are going to carry these things out. Whereas the intelligence people are tend to have a very different job. Their job is to look to as much information as they can, give you the best analysis, and that often involves stressing the uncertainties the difficulties with the information you're dealing with, the things that can go wrong, the alternative explanations. If this were a class of uh, entry-level intelligence people, the, one of the things we would stress is you should try to reach your best judgment, but you always want to talk about the alternatives, the ways in which this information could lead another way, the way you could be wrong the way you could be being deceived. I want to come back to that. That's a very different mindset. And it tends to be conveyed differently. And you can see how it often makes the job of the decision maker more difficult. Um, I should have brought the exact wording. Those of you, I know some of you have read it been on my why intelligence and policy makers clash. So I'll paraphrase the story that, in fact, uh, Gates told about Lyndon Johnson in a meeting in Vietnam. Johnson uh, said, you know what it is with these intelligence people. It reminds me when I was a, uh, growing up on, the, on a farm that I had to milk old Bessie. And finally, I'd hard, I'd work, I'd get her into the stall, and I'd get it hooked up, and I'd, I'd milk her, and I finally got a good, fresh uh, pail of milk. And, those in and then Bessie would 
take her shit smeared tail and she'd swing it and it'll go right through the milk. That's what those intelligence people do. You get something working well and they, they, they swing a shit smeared uh, uh, tail through it. Well, then this again, let me just uh, reinforce what General Gibson said and, and what many of you who've been in these places know and I know from doing some work I did informally with the uh, National Intelligence Officer for Afghanistan. And I saw from that perspective exactly the tension that she described, that uh, he had to write the National Intelligence Estimate, we did them about once every year, about how things were going in Afghanistan and what the prospects were for the coming year. And he had not, not, he personally runs a whole team across the community, including people from DIA and, and CENTCOM. And, you know, he, that group had to say to the president, and this did go direct, I mean, went to others, but does go to the president who read it with great care. Uh, this was under Obama, and he briefed him on it, that um, things were not going well. And the problem is, first, the truth, and I'm putting truth in air quotes, not to be a French post-structuralist, but because the truth is very hard to determine. Even in retrospect, we can ask, look back even at Vietnam, how well was the war going at certain points? You know, we're going to have to define what we, I hate to sound like Bill Clinton, we're going to have to define what we mean by war going well. We're looking at slight picture, better than yesterday, but what does it mean for tomorrow? Because we may be doing better, but that's just going to mean that the enemy knows that, and he's going to adapt, and so tomorrow we're going to be doing worse. So we look like we're doing better, but that isn't really what the decision makers need to know, because it isn't an inevitable path getting better and better, and we're going to face great difficulties. So, um, and in, in uh, counterinsurgency, what are the indicators you look for? We don't have, uh, you know, the uh, forward ed of, edge of the battle trace. We can't do that. We can't, and we can't really count tanks and things destroyed. So it's extraordinarily difficult, and we never were able to come up with really good indicators either in Vietnam or in uh, Afghanistan and in, in, in Iraq, and. How do you manage the situation when the intelligence, everyone's looking at the same indicators, is true, what General Gibson said, but they can't help but weight them differently because the people who are on the front lines, figuratively or literally, do, they're reporting back, but they get a visceral feel for things that they cannot readily convey. You know, you're going through villages, what's the attitude? You can say, oh well, they seemed in this group friendlier and more cooperative. But that doesn't, for the people who are actually there, you say that, but you're really literally feeling something in your gut when you're no longer quite as worried about being ambushed that afternoon. You get a feel for what's happening in that area that can't be conveyed. So you have different information, and uh, you have different biases. And we all have biases, and I just again say that uh, General Gibson's absolutely right. The key thing is to try to be aware of them. That is, be aware of the, what you expect the information to say so you can uh, counteract the normal called confirmation bias, which is very powerful, which is a tendency to see what you expect to see and what you want to see. And when you have people who are deeply involved in operations, and I don't necessarily mean here military operations, but like Johnson, the broad policies, you can't help but be invested in them. If you don't believe in it, you can't do your job. So the jobs that the intelligence people have and the operators have means that when they're doing them well, they will automatically have uh, 
frictions and tensions. And the particular difficulty is to realize that and still establish the trust so that when the intelligence person comes in and says, look, I'm really pretty confident of this, the consumer will be critical. I'm going to come to that in a second. But will understand, oh, he's or she's not just trying to ruin my day and undermine my position. Uh, but you have to be, the commanders of the consumers have to be willing to listen to very uncomfortable things without, and again, General Gunn's absolutely right, they want to be critical of it, which I'll come to in a minute, but not discouraging because the signals the consumers send off, especially in the military chain of command, but even where I've done most of my work in the civilian thing, make an enormous difference in the quality of the information that will be coming up. Because if it's clear to the people producing the information that you're not taking it seriously, you're not thinking about it, you're not going to get to hear what you need to hear. So managing that tension is extremely difficult. This does not mean in any way that the consumers should uh, uncritically accept intelligence because there's always enormous uncertainty. I think it was maybe Mike Hayden or one of the leaders who, who said that uh, analysis, intelligence analysis is what you do when you don't know which is right, it's not a simple matter of the facts. It, it means there are always going to be uncertainties. And consumers have to be critical. They have to really probe and look in some detail as to, wait a minute, what are your assumptions? What are you drawing on? Aren't there alternatives? Have you considered this? And one has to do this in a sense an even-handed way. If you only probe uh, as a consumer deeply when the intelligence is d disturbing to what you want to do, that's a form of politicization. You have to be willing and able, it's very hard, to probe and say, hey, yeah, that makes sense. That means I've been right all along. You have to probe that with as hard as one disagrees, and that is not easy. Interestingly enough, one of the studies I did uh, for uh, CIA was the Iraq WMD intelligence failure, and I tell that story in, in the book, Why Intelligence Fails. What I learned later was that the most critical memo that I believe um, exists, and I'm not sure because there's enormous documentation, and then and later I haven't been able to read all of it, but the most critical was from a, someone in the military, and I've for, forgotten, who, who, who went through the intelligence and pointed out to, uh, I don't know as the chairman of the joint, some quite high, that the intelligence may be right, but it was all based on inference. They were piling assumptions, and they were going on thin evidence to a conclusion that was quite plausible, but actually was not supported in the way you might think unless you really probed it. And that memo did go to Rumsfeld. At that point, we lose the paper trace. We, we simply don't know. We, Bridger didn't go to the White House. But it was very interesting that uh, this person, and I don't think there's an individual name attached to the slides, had uh, got it absolutely right. And that shows first that it can be done, and so it can be done in the context of also the, you know, the military analysis. Now I'm running, I just, what's my time? I just, what, five? Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, the te the um, relations between intelligence and policy are difficult, and policy is difficult, and, and intelligence is difficult as well, for a couple of other, there's a number of reasons, and let me just mention a couple. 
One I want to pick up on that uh, because General Gibson did not mention it. Otherwise, I mean, her talk was really extremely comprehensive and, and excellent. And this is deception. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Obviously, that in both the military but often the broadly political thing, we're dealing with adversaries who want to deceive us. And even when they're not deceiving us, you have to be aware of the danger of deception. Now, this cuts both ways because sometimes the belief you're being deceived can get you into trouble in Iraq. Uh, we realized that we were not seeing enormous evidence of Iraqi WMD programs. And the analysts, both civilian and military, said that was because Saddam had extensive uh, deception and denial programs. So we were seeing the tip of the iceberg was the phrase they used. That made perfect sense. Saddam had been trained by Soviet people, and the Soviets had, and as the Russians have, extensive deception and denial programs. So that was perfectly plausible. Turned out to be wrong. We were not seeing the tip of the iceberg. We were seeing everything that was there, and a lot of things we were seeing were not there. Uh, but the point is that twofold, that first the deception, you can be deceived by things when you think the enemy is deceiving and not. But second, you constantly have to be aware of the danger, the information you're getting is deceptive. Uh, from my, well, Dennis Ross, who did have, had a lot of positions in various administrations dealing with the Middle East, told me that uh, whenever he was dealing with intelligence, especially you know, the SIGINT and human we're getting from adversaries, he'd always ask himself, why is the adversary letting me see this information? Well, sometimes the answer is he has no choice or, you know, no, we're better than him, we are a step ahead. But the awareness of that is very difficult when, again, your job is to get cognitive closure and to decide what to do and carry it out. And <clears throat> I've worked with some of the people who plan deception, try to detect deceptions. And the relations between the people whose job it is to detect deception, and not only the consumers, but the worker bee analysts are very difficult. Because uh, if you're an analyst and you're trying to make sense of all this data, and you know there are all sorts of puzzles, to have someone come in and say, let me tell you that I think some percentage of this is deception, and I think it's this, but I can't be sure. This is a very uneasy relationship. Um, let me just then end with one other point related to that, and the importance of confirmation bias. That is, we, all of us, tend to interpret incoming information as consistent with and indeed confirming what we already believe. Uh, this is a, we can, Rose can talk about the evolutionary roots of this. We're all wired to do this for a reason that's very relevant to most of your jobs because we're all wired to take action and do things. And it's fine to talk in the classroom about being open-minded and waiting and all that, and intelligence often wants to wait for more information, but often you can't. And so we're hardwired to be ready to act. And when we do that, we will tend to either dismiss information that indicates we're wrong. The problem, and it's not a problem of the military, it's not a problem of, of the political world, it's a problem of human beings acting in the world, is how to balance the need to make decisions, the need to reach cognitive closure and to act with an understanding that the information you're acting on may be wrong and you have to be open to realizing you're wrong while at the same time uh, moving strongly ahead with your course of action. That is an extraordinary problem for all of us. Thank you.
Well, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here, and thanks to Dr. Lester for inviting me, and um, it's also a real honor to follow my dissertation advisor, Bob Jervis, who taught me everything that I know um, and a lot of stuff that I've forgotten. Um, so uh, this, um, what I want to do today is tell a story about Pearl Harbor and Midway. So it's a story about um, snatching success out of the hands of failure. And this idea, like all of my books, uh, results from a throwaway line of Professor Jervis at a conference where he was like, you know, when we do intelligence reform, we often throw out the baby with the bathwater, and we throw out a lot of things that are really valuable um, with um, things that haven't worked so well. And so no one really looks at success. And that was the um, inspiration for this particular book which does not include the case that I'm going to talk about today because my co-author who forced me to write this chapter then decided he didn't like it well enough and so um, it became a separate article. But what I want to do is tell a story. Um, so this is a picture of the house uh, from the front door of the house I grew up in. I grew up in Hawaii um, and this is from Halava Heights Road. It was a picture taken in the 60s looking down to Pearl Harbor. Um, so my father was stationed on one of the ships that was attacked by the Japanese on December 7th, 1941. That's how I originally got interested in this kind of work. Um, two interesting things about this picture. One is the guy who was the Japanese spy who drew the picture of the harbor for the people in Tokyo lived one block over and two houses down. So this would have been the view of the harbor he had when he was drawing it. Um, the second is two blocks over, um, Barack Obama grew up around the same time I did. We went to high school together. And my uh, birth certificate looks exactly like his does, even though um, <laughs> I was born in the in Tripler Army Medical uh, Center Hospital. Um, so I want to uh, tell you a little story about, so just so you know, this is what the harbor looks like today. This is, you can see the memorial there. I hope you can see it. So it's just a difference in perspectives between what it looked like in the 60s and what it looks like now. This is my father's ship. It was a tugboat called the USS Snadden. You can see the palm trees there. And that was the ship that he was stationed on on December 7th. Um, he um, joined, actually, he was quite a bit older when I was born, and he uh, signed up at 13 to join in the First World War. And then on the way to the ship over, the war ended, and so he came back and spent the 20s in San Diego and the, and the 30s and 40s um, through the rest of the war in Hawaii. So just to back up a minute and tell you a little bit about what the Japanese were trying to do. They were trying to launch an attack on the American fleet and take out the American fleet because they didn't have very much oil and they knew that if they didn't take a bold move, they would essentially not be able to have a shot uh, to win the war. And so they were trying to get the fleet in Hawaii. Um, the American administration, led by FDR, really did not think that Hawaii would be a target, both because it was so far away, but also because technically the harbor is a hard harbor to have a torpedo shot of, especially at that time, because it's a very shallow harbor. So they didn't think they could get the torpedoes to land and hit the ships right. They were unaware that the Japanese had made some technological innovations that had these um, flipper switches on the, tor the torpedoes so that when they dropped, they could not go down very far and still go forward, which they were unaware of at the time. So this is the um, situation in the Pacific at the time. And this um, shows you a little bit about the attack in Pearl Harbor the morning of December 7th. What's interesting about that is they actually did have two warnings that were ignored. And part of the reason they were ignored was because of a lack of communication between the Army and the Navy. Um, this story actually builds on both what um, General Gibson as well as Bob Jervis talked about, which will clearly be the theme of the morning, which has to do with trust, and trust between the operational actors and the intelligence actors. And part of what happened here this day is that there was actually a Japanese midget sub that came into Pearl Harbor about an hour before the attack. And uh, the Navy found it and took it out and didn't do anything about it. Didn't say, gee, it's strange we have a Japanese midget sub in the you know, harbor on this morning. Um, simultaneously, there was a Japanese reconnaissance plane that came out over Kahuku Point, which you'll see at the top. Um, and it happened around 7 o'clock in the morning when there was a change of shift. And they saw it. They thought it was a little strange. They reported it, and they were basically told to ignore it. Now, the Army and the Navy both had independent information then about things that were happening, but they never communicated. And um, Army uh, uh, 
uh, General Short and, and Navy Admiral Kimmel were out playing golf. And everyone knew on Sunday morning you didn't want to disturb them playing golf. And so um, these guys were not actually given the information. So what happens is, I'm going to show you a series of pictures, some of which were official Japanese photos, some of which were taken by my father. This is a picture of um, the planes coming in over Diamond Head on December 7th. They were expecting a series of reinforcement flights from San Diego, so when they originally saw it, they didn't think it was particularly strange. Um, it was 10 minutes to 8 on a Sunday morning. My father was out washing his car. Um, his neighbor was out washing his car. Apparently, that's what men did in 1941 on Sunday morning. And um, his neighbor, his two little kids were out with their tricycles. Um, and they see these planes coming in, and initially they think they're the reinforcements from San Diego. And then they fly in low enough, and they see the insignia of the rising sun, and they think, oh my god, this is really bad. So my father um, rushes in his house. These are all the stories he told, because obviously I was not born. But um, he said he did two things. The first thing he did was turn on the radio, and it was church music, right, because it was Sunday morning. There was no warning, there was no anything. And the second thing he did, which is very much my father, is he got a rifle. And he went out and started shooting at the planes. Um, <laughs> he was a sharpshooter. Um, and to the day he died, he said that he took out one of the planes. I was always very skeptical. <laughs> but doing this book, I actually came across some pictures that were low enough over where I lived that while it's improbable, it is not impossible that he took out one of those planes. <laughs> so this is, this is the picture of what they saw. Um, so the, the story that I should say is that the standard interpretation of Pearl Harbor is Rebecca Wolstetters, who um, the provost mentioned this morning, which is this notion that there was a, you know, it's very difficult to distinguish the signal from the noise. And while that story may be true about things like 9-11, it turns out not to be true about Pearl Harbor. And the reason it's not true about Pearl Harbor is there was a lot of noise, but there was no signal. So there were 40,000 cables related to this, only seven of which, if you had combined them in the correct way, in the correct context, in the correct time, you might have been able to assume that it was possible that the attack might be on Pearl Harbor. But in fact, the word was never mentioned, and it was just as easily applicable to places like Guam. And so, in fact, what happened was the Japanese were very successful at keeping things secret. And so there was no noise to differentiate from the signal. And you can see that a little bit, I think, with some of the terrorist actors now who eschew cell phones and social media and only use careers because they know that's how they get tracked, right? And so there is a bit of strategic interaction. Just because you act doesn't mean somebody else isn't reacting to what you're doing. So um, I wanted to show you some of the pictures. This is one of the official Japanese pictures. You can see the dive bombers are circled here. This is a, a, the first attack. Um, you see Ford Island in the distance, Battleship Row. Um, this is the first attack on the West Virginia. Um, here's a better sh uh, picture of Battleship Row and a picture of Ford Island where they attacked the um, planes. Part of the reason that... Um, the even one hour of difference would have made uh, an enormous difference in the outcome of what happened that day if they had put together the information about the reconnaissance flight and the midget sub, is that they would have been able to scramble the planes. The planes were, um, you know, head to toe, tip to, tip to snout on Wheeler Air Force Base because what they were really concerned about was domestic sabotage. So what they were concerned about was protecting the planes from the Japanese local people who lived on the island, sabotaging the planes. And so when the Japanese came in and strafed it, they were able to take out all the planes really quickly because they were all in one mass. And that's what the difference that the one hour could have made would have been to scramble the planes. But here you can see um, the very first leaking of um, uh, the West Virginia, which was hit. In the back, you'll see the California trying to leave the harbor. It didn't get out. but um, that's the other ship that is uh, circled. This shot is to just show you how high the water went up uh, when the original attacks went. This is also a Japanese um, military photo. This is from the sky. And you can see the ship that's leaking oil there is the Arizona. Um, there's also the West Virginia and the Oklahoma that were hit. And you can see that from this angle. Um, this is uh, the Arizona being hit from the side. You can see there's an enormous amount of smoke. Um, there's uh, the West Virginia is also on fire. And they're trying to put out the flames with the ship on the side. Um, 
This is um, the West Virginia as well. Now, um, this is a shot of the guys trying to rescue the guys who went into the, the ocean. So what happened was a lot of them, when the ship started exploding, um, all the hatches were open because they were expecting inspection on Monday morning. So um, there was a lot more damage than would have happened again if you had had an hour difference and been able to close the hatches. It would have made a tremendous difference. What ended up happening is there was a lot of oil on the um, surface of the water. You can't see it, but the oil caught on fire. So all the guys who went into the ocean had to um, come up through burning oil to get rescued. Um, so um, when they saw the attack, my father and his neighbor got in the car. They went in the worst traffic jam ever down to the bay. They spent about three days fishing guys out of the water. Um, and um, most of them were covered with burning oil. And it was a series of nightmares he actually had for the rest of his life because it was such an intense experience. Um, and there were about 2,300 people who were killed and about 1,100 who were wounded. Um, this is the Sanadin um, saving a, a ship called the Raleigh. What they did was they MacGyvered keeping it above water by attaching pontoons to the side of it and then having the tugboat keep it afloat. If this attack had happened in the ocean, the ship would have sunk. But like with many of the ships that were sunk that day, they actually did fix them and recover them, and they fought through the rest of the war. There were two ships that weren't recoverable, the Oklahoma and the um, Arizona, but the rest of them um, actually were eventually put out to service before the end of the war. Um, this is a shot of the Arizona at the end of the day. You'll see the flag is still flying. They're trying to put the um, uh, fire out with uh, water. It took almost a whole day to sink, um, and so you'll see it's partly afloat and partly underneath, but the um, attempts to salvage it did not work. Uh, this shows you the next day. You'll see the size of the men on the front. It's the Downs and the Cason. These were ships that were completely destroyed. And behind it, you'll see the Pennsylvania, just to give you a sense of the scale of uh, the size of the ships, but also the enormity of the damage that happened to those ships that day. Um, this just shows you the all the planes that were burned on Wheeler Field because, again, um, they were not scrambled and they were all sitting very closely because the concern was domestic, not foreign uh, invasion, which tells you that when your notion about what your threat is is incorrect, you can actually suffer devastating losses. Um, and this is a picture of the telegram that my father sent to his parents to tell him that he lived through the attack. Notice the date. It's several days later. So this is not the dates of cell phones. Um, and he could not get a message through. So for a week, they didn't know whether or not he was dead or alive. This is actually um, what I wanted to have be the cover of the book. And um, the press said, that's not a good cover. You need this crazy chess game on the cover. And so I didn't like the chess game on the cover. But different people have different notions about what's important. Um, so just to show you, this is what the Arizona Memorial looks like now over the ship. Um, the Japanese hit a turret. So like um, and Professor Jervis was saying, you hit the turret, it goes down into the magazine, the whole fuel explodes. That's what happened. It took all day to sink. Um, so you can see the memorial across it. It's a, it's a really beautiful memorial, if any of you have gone. I, I donated the flag my father had that day and some other stuff to the museum. Um, and they have all the names on the front uh, of the people who died. It's still, to this day, uh, leaks oil. So you can see it. It's like little drops of blood that come to the surface. It's really a remarkable uh, memorial um, to uh, the attack and to the men who, who's really whose grave is there. This gives you a sense of scale and size. So that's a memorial in the background. That's the aircraft carriers that basically ended up winning the battle it really ended up winning the war in the Pacific uh, through the rest of the Second World War. This, these were Nimitz's babies. Um, it was a stroke of luck that the three aircraft carriers that were supposed to be in the harbor that day were out on exercises. Had they not been out on exercises, it's really possible the war in the Pacific may not have been won by the Allies. Um, and so the second part of this story is really a story about intelligence that relates to the aircraft carriers and also the way that the intelligence community uh, really took victory out of this uh, failure. Um, and it's a story of these two men. So I talk about trust. Uh, Joe Ro Rochefort, who's the guy on the, I guess, your left, um, who ran the cryptology unit uh, in, after Pearl Harbor. 
He was a remarkably unique guy. He had lived in Japan, he spoke Japanese, he had been trained by General Stafford in intelligence, and he ran a very small team of five people who ended up breaking the uh, Japanese military code and really um, ended up winning the war in the Pacific. And some of you will recognize Admiral Nimitz. So when I was a kid, um, it wouldn't happen these days, but my father was this diehard Republican, my mother was a diehard Democrat, she thought that Roosevelt was wonderful and saved her from starving in the Depression, and my father, to the day he died, uh, agreed with Admiral Layton and thought that Roosevelt knew that their attack was going to happen, it was going to happen at Pearl Harbor, and he let it happen to bring America into the war. Um, so um, when I was two years old, we went to visit Hyde Park, and my father, who really, really hated Roosevelt, um, made me pee on his grave, which I did when I was two years old. <laughs> so, true story. So when I wrote my book on medical illness, I went back to Hyde Park to do the research. And I went out to the grave. I apologized to the grave. I said, look, wasn't a whole lot I could do. I was two. Um, but when I was growing up, my father, who wouldn't allow a picture of Roosevelt to be hung in the house, um, they compromised on a picture of John Kennedy and Admiral Nimitz. Um, so that was, I grew up with a picture of Admiral Nimitz in the house. Uh, this is a, this is a, uh, Raymond Kelly, he's uh, the, you've got to have an evil, nefarious character in the story. He's the bad guy. Um, he was in Washington, D.C. He was the one who made the decision to privilege diplomatic traffic over military traffic. He was also the one who prevented that diplomatic information from being passed along to Hawaii. It was passed along to other places like San Francisco that then took appropriate um, uh, precautions on the days of the attack, um, but he's basically, um, like other actors in this, um, not a good not a good citizen. He's in D.C., Rochefort is in Hawaii, so part of what's happening is the close bond that builds up between Nimitz and Rochefort actually has to do with the fact that they're physically close to each other. So we think that, you know, in the day of social media, it doesn't matter where you are, it absolutely matters where you are. And even the recent stuff looking at, you know, academic publications and, and cancer research, it shows that the most productive, most successful work is people who are in the same building. So it really matters, and that's part of what goes on here. These two women, so to go back to what um, uh, General Gibson was talking about this morning, one of the great things about a great um, intelligence chief, which Joe Rochefort was, is he was great at supervising other amazing people. So this is a hidden figure story. These two women broke the Japanese military code. Um, it's, uh, uh, on the right is Agnes Driscoll, and on the left is Genevieve uh, Grochen. And they were the ones who ended up breaking the there were five people in the unit headed by Rochefort, including Rochefort. But these were, and this is before computers, right? They did it with paper and pencil. After the war, they did what women did at that time and got married and had kids. And, you know, in 2010 or something like that, were inducted into the NSA Hall of Fame for their contribution. But basically, there was a great interview with Grochen at the end of her life. And they said, well, you know, aren't you disappointed that you didn't have this amazing career at the end of the war? And she's like, I did. I had kids. Um, so it was a, it's a very, very interesting um, you know, it's a very interesting um, way in which the, the time worked um, both for and against the success of, of these people in breaking the code. So um, what ended up happening was that um, Rochefort developed this very tight relationship with Nimitz. And early on, um, after the war, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, they needed to have a success. And Rochefort worked really hard throughout the, he was essentially fired in a political story I'll uh, tell, finish telling in a minute. But right after the attacks, he convinced Nimitz that the next attack would be at Coral Sea. And the people in um, DC said, that's ridiculous. It's gonna be at Guam, it's gonna be in the Philippines, it's gonna be in these other places, it's not gonna be at Coral Sea. And um, uh, Rochefort did a very uh, clever example to show that he was right. He sent by underground cable, which he knew couldn't be cracked, to um, Midway uh, saying, please put on open channel that you're running low on water. Because they had a code that they thought meant Midway, but they weren't positive. And then a couple days later, they broke code that came from the Japanese saying, AF is running low on water. And so they knew that they had broken the code. They knew that AF was midway, and that's what they needed. And he used that to convince Nimitz. And Nimitz says, this is a big risk. This doesn't work. I'm not going to be able to keep my carriers. And he said, no, it's really going to work. And it worked. And this was, in fact, the battle that turned around the war. 
uh, began turning around the war. So um, the Japanese attack happened. They anticipated it. They were able to sink. Um, uh, the, the U.S. lost the Lexington, but they were able to sink a number of uh, Japanese carriers, and it was really the battle that, that starts to change things. But that's not the big success. The big success is really Midway. But again, because you have to have bad guys in the story, these guys are brothers, Joseph and John Redman. They were to be kind, unctuous self-promoters. Um, they uh, ran the uh, intelligence office in D.C. at the time. They were friends with Raymond Kelly, and they thought Rocheford was not appropriate, mostly because these guys had come up through academies, and Rocheford was sort of a Mustang, right? He entered as a, you know, enlisted man, worked his way up. He wasn't part of the insider crowd. They didn't like that. Um, they wanted to keep power in Washington. They didn't want it to be out in the fields, and they fought consistently against him. They, in fact, led to him being fired right after the success in Midway uh, in 43. Uh, and again, he was eventually, I think in 2010, also inducted into the NSA Hall of Fame through the constant um, barrage of Admiral Nimitz who supported um, saying he's really the reason we won the war. So the decision about how to run the rest of the war, so you know, they have the success at um, uh, Coral Sea. They then have the attacks at Midway. And those were the attacks where um, there was definitely a bit of luck. But because Nimitz had learned to trust Rochefort's information because of what had happened at, battles, at the Battle of Coral Sea, when the, um, when the brothers, these guys, the Redmen, said, no, the next attack is absolutely coming at Guam, it's coming at Fiji, it's coming in the South Pacific, um, Rochefort said, no, you know, we broke the code, we're positive, it's at um, Midway, this is where you need to move the ships. And Nimitz trusted him because of the previous success which he had never had with these guys and because he was close to them on the ground in Hawaii. And um, so Nimitz basically, against higher orders, took the ships, sent them to Midway. Um, they were around there for two or three days. They were running out of fuel. They were gonna come back and the um, second in command, McCulley says, I'm just gonna take another, you know, go around. I'm gonna spend another day seeing what's out here. Sees a Japanese ship, the Atishka, I think. Um, that was a surveillance ship, followed it back to the carrier groups and, and sunk four um, Japanese aircraft carriers out of a total of 11. And because of what they had lost at the Battle of Coral Sea, it was essentially the end of their ability to compete in the Pacific. So it was a huge victory for which he was fired. Rochefort was fired. So what does this matter for higher up? This matters because uh, Roosevelt had a very serious decision he had to make in June of 1944, where he had to decide whether the future of the campaign in the Pacific would be what Nimitz wanted, which was to eliminate island hopping and using the aircraft carriers as the foundational basis for conducting the end of the war and the attack on Japan, or whether he should follow MacArthur's island hopping strategy. Um, and MacArthur uh, wanted the island hopping strategy because he wanted to go back to the Philippines where he had had this colossal failure. And he said, I'm gonna come back. And so that was his <clears throat> uh, plan. I've written very extensively in the book um, uh, with regard to the Korea case about his narcissism. And we can talk about that later if you want. But basically that's what's going on. So um, Roosevelt's a really sick man. He's very, very, very ill. He has advanced stage uh, arteriosclerosis. He's got maybe four good hours a day. He takes this very arduous journey to Hawaii. Um, this is, oh, I, I was gonna show you um, I, one of these slides got ahead of myself. These were the two different plans, right? So Nimitz wanted to go to Japan th using aircraft carriers um, on a direct line, basically through uh, Taiwan and up into Japan. And MacArthur wanted to do this island hopping strategy, which had had colossal losses earlier, right? Like especially at Peleliu and places like that, just phenomenal losses because they were taking these islands because they needed the airstrips. And Nimitz was like, you don't need to lose all these people over these nothing, you know, atolls in the Pacific. Let's just use the aircraft carriers. You don't have to take these losses. We're going to have a much more um, direct success. So going into this meeting, which happens in the Holmes estate in Hawaii, that's the picture down below, um, Roosevelt has to make a decision between these two guys. You see the picture up above with the map of the Pacific and they're fighting it out. He goes into this meeting and he's convinced um, that Nimitz is right, that this is the way that the war needs to be um, done. They sat in this meeting for two and a half hours, two and a half hours. 
And the end of which, Roosevelt gets increasingly agitated because it's lunchtime and he's hungry and he wants to eat and he doesn't want to listen to these guys battle it out. And basically, he knows MacArthur isn't going to give in. And so he just summarily changes his mind and says, we're going to do the island hopping strategy. And it was a decision that was made, you know, literally in that one period of time that had colossal consequences for the rest of the war because of the number of men who died in places like ok Okinawa. So you'll see the picture of them uh, sitting there. Um, and this is how the uh, end of the war ended up happening with the leapfrogging campaign that um, MacArthur did um, and that uh, Roosevelt sanctioned, which caused a lot of unnecessary uh, deaths because um, he didn't go with Nimitz's notion. There was some uh, use of the aircraft carriers after that period of time, but not to the extent that would have actually been successful in saving a lot of lives, even though the ultimate campaign, of course, emerged victorious against the Japanese. An enormous amount of what was successful was that they were able to eliminate the Japanese naval fleet through cracking this military code. So by cracking the military code, by the end of 1944, they could not do transport reports on the Japanese fleet because there was no more Japanese transport um, uh, as a result of having successfully broken the code and figured out um, what to do. So, you know, I think that this story, um, like Professor Jervis starts out, um, Anecdotes are very illustrative. Um, they can also be very informative, although, of course, analogies can be misused. But what's interesting and useful about this, to my mind, is the critical role that the trust plays between the intelligence officers and the operational command. Um, and that even when you're right, you can still be punished, but you end up saving a lot of lives. So um, with that, I will close. And thank you very much for uh, listening to my story. <laughs> Thanks so much for two great talks. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to question and answer. Unfortunately, General Gibson had to leave us, um, but we've got two other excellent experts here who've just provided, a, I think, a lot for us to talk about. So any questions? Sir and ma'am, can you speak to uh, how the intel community can best balance the need for both secrecy and transparency? Um, the question is, uh, you know, secrecy and, and sharing and use. And it's a, you know, it really is a great question without a definitive answer. Um, that... In a way, the better the information it, you have, the harder it is to use. Because in most cases, if you get really good information, it's from an extremely sensitive source, either a technical source or a human source. If you use that information, you can expose the source because the other side will realize that that information could only have come from a very small number of possibilities and then can eliminate that by some changing codes, which is very expensive or doing nothing, or literally <coughs> eliminating the human agent. Um, so that's one problem. And, uh, there are ways of dealing with it, but say there are no solutions to it. You, know, you can work at things that disguise how you got the information. In World War II, as most of you know, the perhaps deepest secret was the British success in breaking the German codes, the ultra secret. How did you act on that? Well, you would, sometimes you didn't. By the way, there's an urban legend, but it's not true, that Churchill sacrificed the, the city of Coventry to German bombing 
that he knew that they were coming, but he couldn't alert the defenses because that would give away they broke the code. Great story. It's simply not true. Uh, <clears throat> but they did have dilemmas like that. And partly you can generate uh, actions that produce information that then disguise really how you got there. One thing that Ultra allowed the uh, British to track some, not all, but many of the German convoys resupplying Rommel uh, in North Africa. But if you just sent out the bombers to sink them, hey, you know, how'd they know we were there? Instead, the British sent out extensive uh, aerial reconnaissance. <clears throat> and they made sure that the plane that was over the uh, German convoy was seen by the Germans. So that when two hours later the convoy was bombed, Germans said, well, you know, we were seen by aerial reconnaissance. The Germans couldn't, you know, wouldn't know that in fact the, that was a set up because they couldn't have plane, uh, their ships all over to notice where the reconnaissance lights were coming. So there, you can sometimes do that. Sometimes you have to be willing to take losses politically or even militarily to save the source, although one tries to minimize that. Uh, a related problem, which I think is, is well, it's gone in cycles, is the dreaded word compartmentalization. As you know, a lot of, in well, first I want to say that, I want to reinforce what General Gibson said. Do not underestimate the importance of open source intelligence, things that are public. The intelligence community does underestimate it because its particular competence is using highly classified sources. So the IC, I've done a lot of work for the CIA. I think it's a great operation. I have a lot of friends there. I you know, work closely with them. They say, oh, we fully use uh, open sources. They're deceiving you. They're not. <laughs> and it's very hard because it goes against the essence of what their organizations, what gives them their real expertise. But anyway, you know, there sometimes are very important source of information that are very sensitive. When it's very sensitive, you compartmentalize it. It isn't only the SCI, you make a special compartment out of it. My strong sense, I don't have proof, my very strong sense is compartmentalization has increased greatly in really the last, oh, 15 years, partly because there's a reaction to 9-11. We said, oh, we didn't share enough. You know? So it's now, it's not the need to know, but the need to share. Will you do that and the people who are breaking the code or running an agent get very nervous and they react by compartmentalizing. So I, my sense from just the studies I've done, and maybe it's just the random assignments I've gotten, is there's more compartmentalization. And I think we've taken it too far. I've been at meetings where, you know, you can't discuss it because Half the people are read into some crucial things. The other half aren't. You don't know who's read in. Some of the people who aren't read in actually know very well, but they can't admit it because they've gotten the information bootleg. Huh? How can you run the system that way? That said, you know, it would be there isn't a simple answer. Oh, don't compartmentalize. But managing that problem of who you bring in is, I think, perhaps of understudied. And the people who decide who can be read in sometimes fail to appreciate how consequential that can be. I can give one other example where I'm going to have to be a little uh, anonymize a little of this. I can give the general thing, which is the bin Laden raid, where here the crucial question wasn't really how you got the information, but that we had it and were thinking very seriously of planning this raid. Uh, obviously, had it been known that we knew, uh, had 
bin Laden learned that we knew where he was, you know, if he could leave and, and we would lose this. So they kept the so-called bigot list very, very small. As a result, you could not consult the people who were experts about Pakistan and the question of how Pakistan might react to what you do or how you would do it. I think this was, in retrospect, a clear mistake. That is, first, bin Laden does not have a great intelligence network in the United States. Second, the U.S. ability to keep secrets of that sort is pretty good. You know, after the raid, it wasn't good. Everyone bragged too much. This was before. You know, you're dealing with serious people um, in a system where you weren't, you knew you weren't penetrated. But um, I think the instinct, not only of intelligence, and here the decision was by John, it was John Brennan's decision, really. And I worked with John, I think, very highly of him, even if he's gone a little bonkers uh, in the last few years. You know, I think his, he was very conscientious. I think he ended up being too cautious. But I think for the people who are in charge of the information, the instinct to compartmentalize is very strong and needs to be scrutinized, but there is no formula. So sorry for the longer answer to very short and pointed question, but it needs to be scrutinized, I think, more carefully than sometimes the people who are running the systems scrutinize it. Yeah, um, I'll just add one uh, international relations kind of point to that, which is that I think the issue of transparency really differs by regime type too. And so it's one of these things where democracies are actually kind of at a disadvantage, right? Because there's more of a premium on transparency than there might be in other regimes. And it doesn't mean that transparency doesn't have value. It just means that we have to understand that it comes with a comparative cost to dictatorships or other kind of personalistic regimes where they don't need to be as concerned about transparency, where they don't need to think about it. And so um, strategically considering that um, asymmetry can be important in your planning. Um, one of the examples that I'll, I'll just say, and Bob knows this case better than I do, but when I think about that, I think about the uh, rescue mission of the hostages in Iran in 1979, yes, where yeah. because secrecy was at such a privilege, they actually had guys flying the helicopter who weren't familiar with the helicopters. So when one of them had a light go on, it was the kind of thing where if you had flown that helicopter all the time, yeah. you knew that check engine light went on all the time. Like you hit wind, you hit sand, it just goes on. But they weren't the guys who were flying it, because of the secrecy, didn't know that, and so they turned around. What that meant was that they only got six, plan six choppers on the ground when they were planning for eight. They had redundancy of one. Um, it ended up being that when they only got six there, then it was against the plan to go ahead with the mission. Um, and so they decided to abort. Uh, one of the uh, helicopters at that time wouldn't start again because of the way that the um, engine needed a particular kind of um, air to start. And so it really was the kind of thing that didn't need to be a failure, but was in fact a failure as a result in part of the privileging of secrecy over competence. Can I add just two things? First, uh, an, another error in, in Eagle Claw was again an order by my former friend and uh, colleagues, Big Brzezinski. The group, as you know, as you said, oh, you know, was different units from, right. and they never fully practiced. They didn't do what they did in the Bin Laden raid. Set up a mock, mock, mock-ups of the thing because Big was too worried that the Russians would pick it up. Through uh, survey, you know, air, through the satellites, and tell the Iranians why he thought the Russians, the Soviets, would tell the Iranians who they really were not good. But I think he was wrong, but not crazy. But there's a general problem I do just want to mention of intelligence not knowing blue. That is, especially I don't know if it's how it works in the military intelligence, but in civilian intelligence, the CIA. You're analyzing the, what the other side's doing, why it's doing it, what it will do. You don't, you can't comment, of course, on American policy. You can under, that makes sense. But for most countries to know, to understand what they're doing, they're reacting to us and acting toward us. You can't understand 
what, say, Iran is doing now or any country doing now without understanding what the Iranians think we're doing with them, to them, and alternatives. So if you can't analyze, if you don't know what Blue is doing, you're not going to figure the situation out. The situation, my strong sense, if I knew it, I couldn't say it, but my very strong sense is that in cyber, this is an incredible problem. Cyber operations are very, very closely held in cyber command. They are not telling the intel people what we're doing. So our cyber intel people are trying to figure out what are others doing, why are they doing it? Well, you can't, you, that's an enormously difficult, and I have great uh, respect for the people who are doing that. They've done some very good work. But unless you have a sense of what we're doing, you can't make nearly as much sense of what the others are doing. And how you break out of, the, you know, it would take really strong, effective leadership to break out of that. Good luck with that. More questions? Uh, sir, Don Palatinkel, uh, Senior Service College Fellowship at uh, Picatinny, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, oh, you, both of you discuss how important trust is uh, towards the intelligence community, and, and we recognize that. Uh, what do you do once you've lost that trust? And uh, more, more specifically, how, uh, what are the critical steps involved in rebuilding that trust? Uh, um, destroying it's obviously easier than building it. And um, I know more about the destruction than the rebuilding. And someone actually could, could study this. Let me guess, give you the brief story of the, the I don't have worst ever, but the worst I, I'd ever seen. Um, this was the, 19, the 2007 Iraq nuclear NIE. The, you know, the key judgments were published, available. Anyone really interested, if you send me an email, I've written five or six pages of that that I got cleared, uh, at least for circulation, and I'll send it to you. To make a long story short, the uh, intelligence community correctly assessed that previous assessments about Iran were wrong, that Iran had paused, if not halted, warhead design and, and the... Uh, and they got this through very sensitive sources. This had the impact of undercutting the White House policy because they were trying to strengthen the UN sank economic sanctions against Iran. Through a failures of communication between the IC and the NSC, which I later talked both to Steve Hadley and to Admiral McConnell, the DNI, they're talking separately. I don't know them well, but in my brief experiences, they were both very cool, calm, very professional. I raised this question when they, they both lost their tempers, not at me, but at the other. I did not put them together to <laughs> question them. Uh, anyway, each side bl felt the other had deceived them and, and blindsided them and, and that. And the atmosphere then became totally poisonous. That's the easy part. Now, it then got better. And I think, um, well, I think two things. First, everyone realized the atmosphere was poisonous. They, they, so they knew it was very bad. And these were big boys and girls. They realized that this was a situation that could, they could not permit to last, even though each group blamed the other. So each person felt that he or she was blameless, but knew that you, you just couldn't permit this. And so I think, but um, I mean, this part I know, now the rest is speculation. I think the people involved <clears throat> understood that they had to make special efforts, that they had to reach out, that they, you know, I think on the working levels, they were probably just literally informal, let's just do this over drinks. 
at the highest levels. I think there were efforts to say, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And also, a lot of the people involved rotated out. You got new individuals in who were still marked by this, but not totally burned by it. But I think that really is an extraordinary important question. And as usual, by again, starting failures more than successes. I don't know if the, I, if say the business school community that studies these in or a private organization or if the military has studied how to rebuild. If not, they should because we can be sure they're going to be car wrecks in the future and uh, recovering from them as quickly as possible really is important. Um, if I can just add to that. So when I think about the trust problem, I think of it as the marriage problem, right? Like it takes forever to build up trust and then you can destroy it in an evanescent uh, instant. And it's really hard to rebuild, but it can be a wound that actually makes you stronger even though it uh, leaves a scar. And as a psychologist in the crowd, the example I think of is the classic Musfar Sharif uh, jigsaw classroom, right? So you have a situation where he took these boys, you know, adolescent boys, sent them to a camp in upstate New York for the summer and tried to develop hostility between them, which worked very well. It was really easy to develop hostility among teenage boys. It didn't really take much at all. Um, and they did that for some number of weeks. And then he wanted to see if he could overcome the hostility. And basically the way that they did that was by structuring a series of failures that they had to overcome and that they had to work together in, over to, in order to overcome. So they had to, um, you know, they uh, had a bus go off the rails and then they had to, you know, work together to turn the bus over. You know, it's like find a common enemy that together you can work toward. But if you don't trust each other, you know, it takes some activity to be able to have to um, work together toward a common enemy. And you have to define the enemy as common so that you have to both decide that enemy is superordinate and that enemy is worse than you, my internal enemy who I would rather see destroyed than, you know, whatever the external enemy is. I mean, you could, um, in the Pearl Harbor story, you know, there's examples where uh, the internal enemy seemed worse than the external enemy and then that's always destructive. But one of the things that they do, um, again, to, to go back to the marriage uh, example, you know, as a psychologist, one of the things you do in those kinds of situations to try and rebuild trust is you force each person to take the other person's role. So you put each person in the other person's position so that they actually see the world structurally and institutionally from inside the set of constraints, incentives, institutions that the other person has to act on. And then they go, oh, I see, that actually is harder than I thought, or oh, maybe it wasn't personal, maybe it was for this other reason, and that slowly sometimes you can get somewhere with that. But there, there are strategies, but they're hard, and they're, they take a long time, and they aren't always successful. Additional questions? Ruth Ann stevens Clith, Seminar 19, uh, and, and uh, I'm with the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Professor Jervis, you spoke a little earlier about the increased tendency towards compartmentalization of information. And I wonder if you would uh, agree or disagree that, that part of that uh, is, is part of a larger trend in uh, how we're handling intelligence in the post-WikiLeaks and Snowden era, if you could speak to the impact that that is having that you've observed on the IC. Thank you. Yes. Uh, um I think you're quite right. And of course, ironically, uh, the, uh, the initial Chelsea Bradley uh, Manning, Manning uh, leak was uh, so large because of changes that were reaction to over compartmentalization, right? That, that uh, she had access to all this information that was irrelevant to the job because it said, oh, we've just created these extra barriers and they are, they are harmful. Snowden was like that too, right? Well, I think Snowden had access because he, uh, the, you know, when you're a system administrator and, you know, I don't do technical, that he, that that's almost impossible to avoid. Someone who's running the system has to have this. Now, there should be greater technical ways 
of not solving but dealing with it, and I think we probably have some of these in place. I know we do in some areas, which is if you access stuff, there's, you know, it leaves a paper, it leaves the electronic breadcrumbs. And then you should be of systems that automatically say, wait a minute, uh, we should get an alert because this person has been accessing, if not and, and downloading, a lot of things, and that's not in his or her job description. So we should, here's an area I think where technology can really help us. Um, certainly, and both of those leaks were very damaging, as you know, in the State Department, the initial WikiLeaks, not, not the one in Afghanistan, which did put people's lives in danger, but the, uh, the second, the larger with the diplomatic, uh, re resulted in number of ambassadors having to be recalled and, and other things that, uh, so these were, and of course the Snowden, we know the diminution of trust, but the Snowden leak does bring up the question really related to what Rose had said about uh, how much is out in a democracy and how much should be. President Obama, after this, when there were debates about privacy versus uh, extensive listening in, said, this is a debate you know, we need to have. Well, we wouldn't have had the debate unless Snowden had done what he did. I'm, I'm not a fan of what Snowden did. I think he could have done some of what he did differently without as much harm. But it is true that uh, you couldn't have had the debate without some of the information he had put out. It's partly the pendulum swinging that as you get those two leaks, then you react by over-compartmentalization. Then as we have problems caused by over-compartmentalization, we're going to break it down a little more. Uh, it is, uh, you know, so it's always going to be moving. There are particular problems, as you would know, uh, with the State Department, and there are lots of problems with the State Department, but uh, when you're running a facility that is within the IC, is, you know, the CIA buildings and just one big skiff. So you move things around, people talk easily, and people, all the secure phones. When you have an institution whose job is diplomacy, which partly is secret, but not the same thing. You can't configure the physical space the same way. People can't come in and give you a briefing in your room about what do think. So you have to go down the corridor to some airless <laughs> closet. Uh, so you're not likely to do that. And the bonds of trust aren't as readily to can it develop as readily? Uh, since I you know, do these gigs with the IC and think well of it, I do think we need to work on ways in which the uh, uh, State Department can use and absorb the highly classified intelligence in a better way, I think, than we have it now. But. I partly, again, you know, the cultures, I don't have to tell you, you all do rotations. What you know is the culture of each organization is different. And getting the those cross-fertilizations uh, uh, takes takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of work. And, you know, the IC people don't want to brief you on the stuff that, that the most sensitive unless they already on a, also a personal level known you and know that you're not going to talk or not going to tell your colleagues. So it takes a, the intense interaction and Rose again is very right on, on the Nimitz Road for it. It takes uh, people being in the same room and that's why also the relation if you're a consumer and you think, okay, I'm going to read all this intelligence. It's really great. No, no, I mean that is great. It's a relation with the briefer, much at least as much as what's on the paper. That's how you develop the trust. And also, the briefer will tell you, yeah, that's what's on paper. But I can tell you more. I do that. And and in the 
I've had a lot of students both in the IC and in the policy world, and what they all say is that the relation in between the briefer and the consumer at any level is, is absolutely key. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap this panel up now. Um, please reconvene in your seminar rooms at 11 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, we will have a brown bag a lunch discussion for those of you who are interested in pulling apart these issues a little bit more, and that will be in the Mary Walker room. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.